Good morning. Good morning. All right. Let me share my screen. Welcome to artists. Let me just mute a few people. Looks like everybody's almost everybody. Oops. <laughs> They're doing it at the same time. Okay, sounds good. I don't think I hear anybody now. All right, so appreciation. Today we are learning about Haim, oops, I spelled it wrong there. Haim Soutine and Jenny Seville, two artists from Europe. But let me show you the page first. Um, <clears throat> let's see, I do hear someone, there we go. All right, well, I'm trying to show you the, okay, so this is our main page for the day. And then there are several videos. This one right here is great. Some young person with a low budget made a pretty cute movie about Haim Soutine's life. And it's, uh, you know, they're acting in it. So it's nice to see that. Uh, it's 30 minutes. And then there's a, a couple other videos here to look at and artwork and some articles about Haim Soutine. And then some artwork, which we'll go into more detail about. But I also, again, with these two artists, I had some trouble finding the images that weren't so small that they shrink when you save them. So I do recommend just Google both of these artists and look at more of the artwork. Sorry, I'm trying to mute, I'm trying to mute you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so please just Google them because there's a lot more to see uh, just by Googling them than I could show you by saving the work uh, through the PowerPoint. So let's get started with our PowerPoint. So hopefully you got my handout and oh no, I realized actually I, the second part of this handout didn't send. So I, I will send that to you soon um, because for some reason when you save a PDF to a JPEG, it only saves one page at a time. Anyway, I'm going to tell you about Haim Soutin. He was born in 1893 in Lithuania and he was born very, very poor. Um, he studied art at Vilnius, uh, which is in the capital of the Baltic. Um, and then as soon as he was able to get out of there, he moved to Paris, which was at that time the epicenter of the art world. And uh, he became good friends with Modigliani, who I'm sure you've heard of. Uh, and then he had an interesting experience, and actually both of these artists had a very interesting experience with a collector discovering them. So this artist, uh, in Soutine's case, Albert Barnes from the US and there is the Barnes collection uh, is up in the East Coast. I think it's in New York, but maybe it's in somewhere around New York. Um, and it's a beautiful collection Oh, of Philadelphia. There it is. Uh, so you can go see that collection and there's a lot of Soutine paintings there. So what happened was he comes to Paris to look for art and he didn't find much of what he liked that time until he met Soutine and he fell so in love with his paintings that he bought 50 of them. And uh, from that, there was a lot of press. Uh, people wanted to know who was this person who the Bar Albert Barnes just bought 50 paintings from. So this shot him immediately into success and he gained some financial success obviously from um, selling the paintings so he started selling more and more paintings but there's a lot of really strange controversial talk about his life and um <clears throat> who he was some people say he was schizophrenic some people say he was bipolar some people say you know the stories are also strange because um I'm trying to move myself around here because there's a uh, 
lots of different stories with not a lot of evidence to support them. So for example, we don't know his birth date because he said multiple different dates to multiple different people. And he was often quite elusive about where he came from. Like he didn't want people to know that he was from a poor family. Um, this was also during the time of the world war and he is Jewish and they tried to uh, take him, but he, for some somehow, um, the didn't get taken to the camp. Instead, um, he ended up getting sick. But in, before that, I just want to say he did have a few female friends um, that he was engaged with. He had girlfriends, and I don't know that he had children, but he was suffering from a gastric ulcer, and um, today that would easily be curable, but then uh, the surgery that they gave him actually uh, probably ended up killing him. But again, we don't have all the details for a lot of things about his life, and, um, you know, he had a very interesting... Um, obviously perception of the world and his paintings, which we're about to take a look at. So, oh, wait, where's Jenny? There's Jenny. Okay, so Jenny Seville is born in Cambridge, UK in 1970. She's currently living. She is uh, one of the, uh, well, via Selman's I th is the paid female artist in the world um, and Jenny Seville is one of the highest paid living artists in, female living artists in the world. Um, she's from Cambridge and she uh, was a figure painter has always been a figure painter and so she went to school in at Glasgow which is um, a very uh, figure painting school, dominant figure painting school. So I was listening to a lecture of, of her talking about her school and it was, it was very, it's very much like my school where they stress the figure, painting the figure eight hours a day. So they always had a model available constantly. A lot of grad schools now don't, don't even draw from the figure. So to be a predominantly figure painting school as we like to call it um, and to be proud to be figure painters in a time when people were saying figure painting is dead and it's all about abstraction now and um, then there's this resurgent resurgence currently happening of uh, modern figure painting and Jenny Seville is sort of the uh, head of that game there, but uh, you'll probably notice several of the newer artists that I show are in this mode of figuration, but in a looser way and also developing their each one their own individual styles of how to deal with the figure, but not abstract, not completely abstract paintings. So she was born May 7th in Cambridge, um, and then she went to Glasgow, and then she moved um either way the next thing that happens is so interesting oh she also went to uh, the u.s and she did like a exchange program there she had a scholarship to study in the u.s and went to cincinnati and um she was really had this realization while she was looking through the history books and she had an uncle who was in the art world and had she had grown up seeing Titian and seeing Tintoretto and seeing all of these older artist masterworks, Rembrandt. So she had a base understanding of art history. And uh, that base understanding of art history is what helped her uh, be inspired to go to art school and follow down the path of the traditional nude painting, figure painting. So she goes to Cincinnati and while she's there, she's learning, 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 and she realizes, you know, where, where are the females in this book here? Where in this history book, I don't see any females. Yeah, there's Tintoretto. Yeah, there's Titian. Yeah, there's Rembrandt. But there must have been some female painters in between, right? Right. Uh, but the winners write the history books and women are not the winners of history. So... <laughs> Uh, they didn't write the history books, and we are not in the history books, in the art books at all. I've been thinking about that a lot, which is what I do to try to show about half women, half men, and every type of ethnicity, and not just focus on the white male master painters as much as um, they are so important, and nobody loves Titian as much as I do. So don't get me wrong, I love Titian. 
I love Ram. Um, I love Andrew Wythe, which I'm going to talk about later. But <clears throat> okay, Jenny Seville, looking at these masterworks, starts to feel this strong sense of feminism and starts making these giant paintings of female nudes, but not specifically beautiful female nudes. In fact, she said she was afraid of them being beautiful because then they wouldn't be taken as seriously. So she's turning the lens. She's a female painter painting female bodies and doing it not in just a, oh, a beautiful, pretty female here to sit for you and pose, but this is the real fleshy body. Um, I'm probably going to say fleshy a lot today because these paintings are very fleshy. Um, <clears throat> so then Sachi, curator guy, uh, discovers her and offers her a free studio and representation and basically money to just live so that she didn't have to work. And that's what she did. She was supported by him. So both of these artists were discovered by people outside of their um, inner circle. And a lot of times it's more about, oh, I went to Yale and then I went, you know, a feeder school, which was then seen by this museum and da 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 then you're at the you know, but that's not the way this worked for either of these two. They were really just discovered out of the blue. And so that's pretty exciting to have someone believe in you so much that they want to support your life. They want to give you an apartment. They want to give you a studio and they want to say, hey, go paint. And that all paid off for both of these uh, collectors who now own a huge chunk of each of these artists work. So Jenny Seville also had uh, two children and those uh, children inspire her as well. She, she's inspiring to me because she, you know, as women, we often think, you know, can you have an art career huh, as an artist and have children and get married and all those things? And she was, says, oh, I was so inspired by having children. I was growing bodies in my stomach and I was growing bodies on the canvas. That's pretty exciting. Okay, so here we are looking at some very fleshy paintings. Now, before you just go, whoa, Soutine, dead duck here, there's a lot of dead animals that I'm about to show you, paintings of dead animals. But what we're really looking at here in both of these artists is the connection with their finding beauty in the reality of what's really going on in the world and what real women look like and what skin really looks like and how we can describe that in still a beautiful but almost grotesque way. And I'm not saying that either of these are grotesque in any way, but I could see how they're not, um, they're not always the easiest paintings to look at. Um, so take that however you may. Um, so Soutine, when he was a young boy, he encountered a butcher who cut uh, you know, it butchered an, an animal, a bird, and let it bleed out. And that horrified him so much, but he also, he sort of wanted to give it one last life, which is why he then took it and painted it and um, started on this journey of painting dead animals. Again, we don't specifically have all the look into his, uh, you know, no one psychoanalyzed him in the late 1800s, but there was definitely for both of these people an interest in building flesh through paint and to depict things in a very painterly way if you look at the colors of soutine they're just gorgeous colors even if we're looking at a dead fish there are and i don't know maybe that fish is swimming um i don't think so <laughs> there's reds and yellows and greens in the face there's pinks and oranges you can see him sort of just traveling through these greens and putting these confident strokes down and letting them be sort of this raw visceral image um, i mean it it's so thick some of the paint is very thick on both of these artists and and these photographs that I took actually at the Jewish Museum um, of the retrospective that I saw a couple summers ago but I like this because the light literally glistens across the painting so you really get a sense of um, what where there's thickness happening and he sort of left the blobs of the paint um, these 
this painting by Jenny Seville down here is she's used as a, a model from England. She uses photographs of herself. She looks in the mirror. She uses photographs of her children. She draws her children uh, in, from life and she looks at the masters. So that's where she's getting her inspiration and, and I think building these pieces together from multiple sources, not just one. Um, what am I doing? Okay, so this one here on the left by Jenny, this was a blind woman who she who was very um, self-conscious of the way that she looked because she was blind and she felt that she was ugly and Jenny thought that she was very beautiful. So she said that this was the first time that she felt that she let some beauty into the painting. Um, yeah, I disagree. I think there's a lot of beauty in all of her paintings. And even though they are, you know, pushing the edges of, um, you know, someone think of Lucy and Freud and how fleshy. I could have really thrown Lucy and Freud in here too with Soutine or Jenny and Lucy and Freud. Either way, this very sense of using the paint to describe in variations of colors of pinks and tones and oranges and browns and blues to describe the figure. So anyway, to her, she says that she felt that she made a beautiful painting of this beautiful woman and she could see the beauty in her and um, that's what we're looking at here on the left um you know it's still you know um i didn't realize that when i first looked when i looked at these paintings that she, the reason the eyes looked like that was because she is blind and it, it makes so much more sense now so i always encourage researching art, especially if you're feeling judgment about it, especially if you're feeling like, ooh, I hate that, it's awful, it's terrible. Uh, research the artist and you might find something within it that rem resonates within you, your work or your story, or um, maybe now when you see this and you realize what you're looking at, that you really can see the beauty that she's invoking out of her. Um, and over here on the right, we do not have as much beauty. We have a carcass of a, I don't know, a cow, I think. <clears throat> There's so many carcasses. But it's not about the carcasses. It's about the tones. It's about the color. It's about the way the forms are turning in space and how he's describing that beauty to us and sort of giving us one, sort of giving us a eternal life through this animal. Again, I just want to stress that there's a lot of controversial stories about this man, um, that he was, no one really knew who he was. Um, maybe Modigliani knew best, and they did work together, and they were very good friends, and, um, but he had some very low moments emotionally, and then he had some higher moments. Here's Jenny Seville when she's pretty young, uh, maybe an undergrad here, sort of still finding herself and finding her voice. Um, you can see a lot more blues and purples and darks, and look at this floating head. Ugh, I don't like that. Um, but I thought this was an interesting piece because it shows you how ambitious you're 22 years old, um, and how I'm, you can, uh-oh. You can see how ambitious she is. Another carcass over here by Soutine, thinking again about the movement and the gesture of the form. <clears throat> the movement and the gesture of this form, I could talk about this compositionally exactly the way I talk about every figure painting, thinking about the shapes around the figure. Look at these beautiful shapes around the figure, the negative spaces that help us see the positive form. We have sense of lights and darks, tonal, um, and each piece sort of interlocks into its own beautiful shape. I can't say that so much about Jenny Seville's piece here, but I also think that it's not finished. I think that might be beginning layers. I know she, she says she works in a process of layers, starting from very abstract, finding here with the abstraction. And she doesn't know how she's gonna start or what it's gonna become, but she sort of finds the bodies within the painting. Sometimes I do that too. And I don't know, I think Soutine is looking at a reference. He is looking at a real figure of carcass. 
Uh, the, this is some of Jenny's later work that, it, honestly, it got a lot of controversy. This show came out, I think, at Pace Gallery in New York City one or two years ago, and I saw this show. And compared to her earlier work, um, it got a little too cool, too refined, too... Uh, it didn't get good reviews at all. Um, I don't like them as much as I liked the older work, but I do appreciate her attempt and I think it's important to do what calls you regardless of what the art world is telling you to do. So I think her bravery in that is something to really be looked at always. Um, and then this gorgeous bird over here. I really love the gesture of the bird and the wings and how it's sort of falling in space. Um, and I think I, I put these two together because they both have this sort of, you know, falling draping movement. Um, and she's looking at the Pieta and she did a whole series based on those. Uh, you'll see there's a few more in here. <clears throat> um, this is to give you an idea of just how massive her work is um, and how I love it. It's, this piece reminds me almost of a Laura Aguilar photograph. And uh, we've talked about Laura Aguilar's work before. So I don't know if I have it hidden right now. But to give you an idea of just how important it is to her to describe skin and the tones and the flesh. Look at these pinks. They both employ these amazing pinks and oranges and they're not just like oh I'm gonna mix a skin tone and slap it on there right no 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 they're thinking about uh, 20 to 30 different tones within the tones um, they're thinking about flesh and the under colors of flesh, the greens, the blues, the purples, the colors that are harder to see, but if you're paying attention, they can come out. And that's the same for this piece here. He's pushed it a little more with the blues and the purples, the yellows, the oranges. There's really, this is kind of wild in here. So if you ever get a chance to see these, they're absolutely gorgeous. Um, he also really enjoyed uh, painting busboys and bellmen, and uh, they both do some portraits. So Jenny's over here, and imagine that her, this piece is probably 10 feet by seven feet or 20 feet by 15 feet, they're massive. And then this one, probably 16, something like that, a little bit smaller. Um, people also really, these pieces have higher value of soutines because they love the hands and what the hands are doing in the paintings. So if you Google him, you can you can see a whole bunch of uh, different portraits of uh, your average busboy and dishwasher and waiter. And that was something that was really important to him. So in several things that I read, they really stressed how his poor mentality never really left him, even though he gained financial success in his lifetime. And that's it. Um, that's the end of my PowerPoint. I will show you for the last few minutes this very short video by Jenny. If I can move myself, move this. Um, because I feel like it gives a really clear, uh, I think this is it, a really clear, yeah, this is it, a really clear talk about exactly what she describes her work better than anyone can she's very good at speaking about her art and so i'll let her speak somebody i guess my internet's not working very well and i am going to go buy an extender for my internet First time i worked recently and said it was like looking at life through a microscope and i thought you know like an enlarged area of life and I thought that's actually probably that's quite right that's probably what what I'm, I'm childlike in that sense you know like the way a child will turn a stone over and look underneath the stone I've just got that impulse still and I I, I cherish that I've still got kid not, not to have had to grow up <laughs> I am quintessentially figurative I, I am rooted in figuration and Actually, maybe it's not figuration, picture making. I am a picture maker, like I'm an image maker. Even if I start completely abstract, which I do often, just throw loads of paint on a canvas, 
my instinct, my animal instinct is to make something of it. You know, not to let just have paint sensation, but to make an image. And it's, it's uh, that acceptance of my nature that's kept me figurative, I think. But I have a deep love of abstract painting. So the painters I like, like Kooning, Pollock, Bombly, you know, late Monet, where they disappear, and, you know, it, you know, I love late Titian, where they dissolve, things like that. Um, that's where I've learned uh, how to be a painter. So I've learned about paint through them. But I haven't wanted to abandon the pursuit of the figure. I, I've always cared more about a work being powerful than being beautiful. And beauty scared me, I would say. I would have, was afraid that if it was beautiful, it wasn't serious or it was sentimental or something like that. And that, that terrified me to go in that direction. And then I was in Naples and I started working with a blind woman called Rosetta. Through that process of working with her, her beauty kind of came out. She had a lot of self-hatred and disgust about the way she was. Why would I possibly want to paint her to feeling and exuding this incredible beauty? And that journey became very powerful for me and for her. That when I made the painting, I allowed myself to access that beauty. And I think it's the first sort of beautiful picture I made. And so I realized that it was okay to do that. I, th I think the in my work came not inside. I'd spent my whole life trying to paint flesh. And I was painting flesh and growing flesh at the same time. And that was very powerful for me. I always say my kids gave me back my freedom, artistic freedom. I had these two toddlers who were just going crazy on the kitchen floor with paint, you know, sitting there, just painting across the surface of the paper. It's utter freedom. I was like, well, wait, wait, I'm the artist here. What's happening? I then started experimenting an awful lot more and going outside the lines and multiplying the lines and all of these different things. And I, I just rode that wave for many years. I often now start not knowing what I'm going to do, other than it's probably going to be a group of figures. And that's a really exciting way to work because you're on a journey that you just don't know. And it's your creativity in the moment, in the act of making that, that is your journey. I don't, I don't like to have a fixed idea as much now. That, that's the shift. And I'm grateful for my kids. If I hadn't have gone through the process of having a child, I think I wouldn't have been able to do that. The piece Aleppo comes out of a whole series of works that I've been working on for a few years now, which I haven't shown yet. But the first piece I've released has been really, it, it, it's based around the Pieta. And when I was doing the piece, invited to do a piece at the National Gallery, I, it's actually one of the only site-specific pieces I've made. So I didn't know it was going to go through between those two titians. That was, a, that was a new development. But I knew it was going in one of those rooms. Obviously, the relationship with art history, I thought, well, I'm working on this Pieta series. I think I'm going to do something to do with this anyway. And I had a lot of images, I mean, a lot, a lot of images of war, situations and, and they're so remarkably similar whether they're rwanda whether they're bosnia whether they're iraq syria you know that's maybe the color of skin and the physiology changes a little bit but the basic impulse is the same and we do this again and again as humans we just blow buildings up we kill each other we have children that are dying in our arms and you, you sort of think oh gosh we're like we, we just repeat this cyclic pattern and i've got two children so i felt very Know, try to imagine what that would be like and and, um, and it was that it was very it actually very difficult making the work I had to divorce myself from the feelings that I had about if they were my children because that's quite painful to imagine and okay I'm gonna let you watch the rest of it on your own if you find interest in that and I'll open it up for uh, any comments if anyone wants to type in or unmute yourself and you can just say how you feel about either one of these artists. Anyone? Now's your chance. No? Love it, hate it? Wish you hadn't seen it? <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Right here. And you can make a work. I like uh, Jenny Seville or Soutine or let's just say something fleshy, make a fleshy work of art or post a comment on my page. 
uh, I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to see your work and we would all love to see your work. So thank you.